All right, welcome to the first unit in Introduction to Wireless Communications. I'm Professor Sandeep Brungan at New York University. So in this unit, I'm just going to give you the very basics of the physical mechanisms that underlie wireless communications, namely propagation of electromagnetic waves and antennas that transmit and receive those waves. So in this unit, what I'm hoping you will learn is how to mathematically describe an EM wave. I want you to also learn how to identify radio spectrum and some power levels and those that you will find in products that you use all the time. We're going to uh, review some basic power calculations and how to do them in dB scale. I'm going to also talk a little bit about geometry so you'll be able to understand propagation geometrically and that will just be a simple review of some high school uh, polar coordinates. And then I'm going to show you how to use tools in MATLAB to actually compute uh, various key antenna parameters. Also show you how to compute the received power in certain angular dimensions and compute a very important property which is the free space path loss. And I'll also show you how to derive that equation for the free space path loss, which is Friis's law. All right, let's start with our first section, which is the basics of electromagnetic waves. So electromagnetic waves are really the physical basis for all sorts of properties in the universe, but they're in particular here, what's important is for all radio communication. So really there are two um, closely related forces when you think about e and electromagnetic radiation. There's the electric force, which is of any force between two charged particles, and the magnetic force, which is the force between any particles that are in motion. Now, what this means is that what's important for electromagnetic radiation for wireless communications is that these forces operate at a distance, meaning that if you have a current, which is the motion of charged particles in one location, they will induce motion or current of in charged particles in another location. And that very clearly gives a way to communicate information. Just to understand that, Suppose we have a transmitter, which is an antenna, and in this antenna I have a current, and I modulate information onto that current. This current will generate an electromagnetic field in space, and then at a distance that will induce currents in the receiver. And if I can modulate the information I want in the transmitted signal, hopefully I can detect it at the received signal, and thereby communicate at a distance. And this basic mechanism is what underlies all of electromagnetic, well, all of wireless communications. So let's look a little more into how we mathematically describe electromagnetic fields. So uh, um, electromagnetic forces are represented by a vector field. Now what that means is that at every position, like this purple dot here, the force will have a um, strength which is represented by a direction and a magnitude. Remember that anything with a direction and a magnitude is represented mathematically as a vector. So that means that at every point in space we have a vector like this. And these will create these force lines. In this case, the force field between a, a positive and negative particle. Now, in the electric case of the electric field, the force the units are in newtons per coulomb because they're a force per unit charge. Meaning if you put a charge at this location and you multiplied it by the electric field, it would actually represent that force on that uh, particle. There's no particle there or no charge. There's no force. Similarly, the magnetic field operates or acts upon moving particles and it's the force per unit charge per um, unit velocity. All right, so it has this um, units of newtons per ampere meter or teslas. And they have the notation E and B, so you'll often hear them called the E field and the B field. Now, a very important case of electromagnetic radiation is called the plane wave. Now, all electromagnetic fields are governed by 
key equations, which are called Maxwell's equations, which if you took any E and M class, you would have reviewed them, but we don't need to go over them here. What I just want to mention is what you probably covered in an EM class, is that in free space, all solutions can be deco decomposed into what are called plane waves. Now, plane waves mathematically have this expression here, which means that the electric field as a position of the um, as a function of the position and time, have this sinusoidal function like this. This is an electromagnetic field that travels in the x direction, but you can rotate it into other directions as well. And the B field has this sinusoidal pattern here. Now, so key um, properties of this is that the electric field and the B field in plane waves are always perpendicular to one another. Also, the B field is proportional to the electric field, and that proportionality constant is just the speed of light. Now, just I want to illustrate this a little more. I got this very nice GIF or graphic from Wikipedia, which shows you the evolution of this electric and magnetic field over time. So here are the mathematical equations, and this is these um, electric fields drawn in x, y, and z as t goes along. Now, there's two ways to think about this. So at any position r, you can see, if you fix the position, that the electromagnetic fields vary sinusoidally um, with the frequency. So if I fix the position, it keeps on going up and down like this. All right, and, so, and it will have some frequency, f, and some phase. And then it'll also have some maximum amplitudes, which are the maximum amplitudes here. Similarly, if I fix the time and I look along this x direction shown here, you will see that it also varies sinusoidally, like this. And if you put these two together, you can think of it like the uh, wave is traveling in some direction, as you can visualize here. And in this particular case, this plane wave is directed along this x direction. Now, a very important way to think about the direction of motion of a plane wave is that the direction of motion is also related to the direction of energy flux or the way that power is transferred in the plane wave. So just to give that mathematically, it's described by something called the pointing vector, and the pointing is the name, it's not the word pointing. It usually has the letter S, and it's the cross product of the electromagnetic fields. When you take that cross product, if the electric field is pointed like this and the magnetic field is like this, the direction will be that orthogonal vector given by the right-hand rule. So let's just say in this case that that is in this EX direction, which is also that direction of motion of the plane wave. And in this case, it will be proportional to the electric field squared. Now, what this means is the interpretation of this is that it represents the energy flux in the sense that if you look at any point, the divergence of this um, S uh, field, this S value, is actually the energy consumed at that point. So what it tells you is how much energy could be or power can be transferred through any um, surface, if you like. So the units for this is in watts per meter squared. The watts coming from power, so it's power per unit area. Now keep this in mind, because when we're thinking about antennas, we're going to talk about something called the antenna aperture or area, which will represent how much energy or power can actually be received or transmitted by an antenna under a plane wave. Now, you'll see here that there is this um, C times U uh, constant term, and this is called the characteristic impedance. And in a vacuum, that characteristic impedance is 377 ohms. It's a fixed constant number. So one um, more thing, little detail that I want to talk about is polarization. And if you remember, the electric field is always perpendicular to the direction of motion. And the orientation of that electric field then, relative to the direction of motion, is just called the polarization. So if you had a linearly polarized um, wave, you can think about it as having some a wave with a constant orientation. 
And here are two examples of this. In one case, it's vertically polarized, so it means that the electric field is in the up and down direction relative to the motion, or you could think of it as horizontally polarized, like this relative to the motion. In this case, I've just written them with the angular frequency and what's called the wave number, just to simplify the notation. Now, of course, you could get in reality is that the plane wave could be um, in any orientation. But in that case, it can just be really always considered as a linear combination of the a vertically and horizontally polarized wave. So you can think of it like two degrees of freedom. Now, given that, you don't actually have to do it to decompose it as linearly polarized waves. You can also do what are called circularly polarized waves, where you take two basis functions that are out of phase. So one is cos plus sine and the other is cos minus sine. And in this case, you'll get this kind of circular evolution like this. But the plane wave is the same. It just will end up being um, a different linear combination of these two uh, basis functions. Now, talking about decomposition, what's important is that really every electric field will always just be a linear combination of plane waves. So if we understand the way that um, um, a channel behaves with plane waves and an antenna behaves with plane waves, we can use superposition to understand more complicated electromagnetic radiation. Now, in this decomposition, each plane wave will have some frequency, a direction of motion, some gain, which is the electric field strength, its phase, and then one or two polarizations. Now, you can think of this then kind of like a 4D um, Fourier transform, where we're taking that electric field over space and time, and we're converting it to something in the wave numbers and frequency, plus some other um, manipulations to handle the polarizations. Now, what is good about the plane wave decomposition is that it has a very simple geometric uh, interpretation that if I have a transmitter and a receiver, generally we can kind of map out the direction of that uh, transmission as it propagates through the path. What's also important is if you take a EM class and you have a more complex environment, this type of decomposition is useful for a lot of solvers to try to actually numerically compute the electromagnetic field, but we won't do any of that here. So this wraps up our first unit. If you go to the GitHub link, which is on the link below this video, if you're watching it in YouTube, you will see a in-class problem and you can go in and just, this is a very, very simple problem. Just make sure you understand uh, some basic manipulations of electric fields and wavelengths. It's in MATLAB. You can just use it and compute it there. There's also solutions in the GitHub. And once you understand that, go on to the next unit.